Okay, so I'm not. Is it switched on? Yes. Okay, yes, now. Okay, thanks a lot. And um, okay, I'm happy to see so many people still here. So this is not the cosmology session, which will just come after this. But I, I will talk a bit um, about what we call astrophysical foreground. And um, in, among other things, so I will, will briefly topic all this or mention this about gamma ray astronomy, about this, um, what is the motivation and where we actually are, and um, what this picture is all about. So, but let me start first with a, with a brief motivation, and then we heard it already before. I think there is this, this spectrum of cosmic rays of charged particles which are hitting the Earth's atmosphere from all sides, which we know now since um, more than 100 years, and there are still, we are puzzling, as already was, was mentioned already, we're still puzzling where these, actually these particles are coming from. And there we, we learned in the last, in the, I think in the past you know, two decades or so, that gamma rays are really excellent tracers for the acceleration side of this ultra-relativistic cosmic rays. So I'm going to just indicate this here on this spectrum, which is again this time multiplied by e to the 2.5. I think it's again to get rid of this very steep spectrum and to show the structure that this, what is here, this brownish band, is actually the, the um, energy range which we cover with today's gamma ray experiments. And the point is that these gamma rays are are not primary particles, but they are just produced in this um, interactions of high energy charged particles. And there are two production mechanisms. First, if you take a high energy proton and you let it interact inelastically with some uh, matter around which we assume is, in the, is present in the sources, you get a neutral pi, um, pions, pi zeros, which immediately decay to photons, which are then gamma rays, which we can detect. But there's also for high energy electrons, there's inverse Compton scattering. So you take high energy electrons and then you take an ambient photon field around, which you have, which is there, for example, at least cosmic microwave background radiation. You have infra infrared background radiation field. You have light from stars around. So you have lots of photons in, in our universe. And then you can upscatter these, these photons to, again, to um, gamma rays. And so this is something which allows us to detect these sources, and then, of course, there is the advantage that you can use photons really to do astronomy. We can really map where they are coming from. And as we will see later, I think there's also the disadvantage that we have these two productions uh, mechanism, but we want to find actually sources of hadronic cosmic rays, and, um, but I will come to electrons later, later in the talk. So this is actually the motivation we have, but there is now, we are spanning now an enormous energy band in, um, in gamma rays, and which start actually at the MEVs and goes up to, okay, this is a bit optimistic now, this is what we are touching the PEV energy scale. And this, of course, you cannot do with a single um, experimental technique. And then there is the disadvantage that our atmosphere is protecting us from gamma rays, which is from the experimental point of view very bad because uh, you need to, if you want to directly detect photons, you have to do it in space. And um, so, okay, if there is now the, the scientific reason is, is obvious to do this. And then, of course, you have to convince a funding agency to give you money to build a satellite because with a satellite, you can easily just detect photons. These are basically particle um, physics detectors. You have a veto shield, you have a tracking detector, you have a calorimeter, and then you can detect photons. And if you then convince your um, funding agency, it gives you a billion dollar, and then you can fly a satellite which has a collection area of one square meter like this, not more. And this, given now the fluxes that we have and this steep um, decrease of the fluxes, allows us to have this with satellite, where the Fermi lat is now the one which is in space, to go to up to GeV energies. And then, from then on, you cannot do this in space anymore, and there you have to do, you have to do it on ground. And then, what you can do there are basically two techniques, which are um, complementary um, to some extent, and just cover also different energy range. First of all, what you can do with this photon interacting in the atmosphere, it produces a Cherenkov light flash, and then you can use optical telescope just to map this Cherenkov light flash and then to reconstruct the initial photons. What I've indicated here is that this approximately that they have, of course, because we're talking about optical telescope, they have just a limited field of view. But what you can do as well is something is that, you, that you just detect not only the trank of light, but the particle shower here, which is produced, and directly produce the particles who do not have any, any light to detect. You can run then day and night, but then, of course, you have to, from this particle shower, you have to identify what, whether this is a photon or whether this is a charged cosmic rays. And um, the, it causes some difficulties, but well, you can see that these both techniques are, to some extent, very much complementary, and there is something what we call this, these 
uh, water Cherenkov systems because you just measure the particles by having water Cherenkov um, detectors on the ground. And um, the other advantage, of course, is you can see here that they have a, just a much larger field of view. Okay, this is now um, the situation as we have it today. So we have as the Fermilab detector. You can see here the silicon um, strip detectors and then the calorimeter here. And this is then what is actually flying in space. But as I said before, this is one square meter. And then we have these Cherenkov telescope system, Magic, Veritas, and Hess, which are currently operating and um, basically in the TV regime. But then with some overlap, there is now Hawk, which is becoming online. I will show you later in this talk a, a presentation. I just try to summarize a bit what are the basic parameters of this system and so you can better um, see what they are actually, where their pros and cons are. I think for a satellite and for this, this Hawk system, they have they cover quite large um, region of the sky and then they have a very high duty cycle. Then, but um, compared to this, these Cherenkov systems in the TV energy range, they have a superior angular resolution and energy resolution, so it's better to map out really what these sources actually are. So, but as you can see, this is very much uh, complementary here on this side. And then, of course, the big advantage is by using this on the ground and just measuring showers, you have a very large collection area, which is then orders of magnitude larger than what you have in a satellite. And this is the reason why we can really do this kind or use this kind of, um, of instrument. But of course here, again, this is a very limited field of view. And in, our, in, the, in the following, I'd like to show you where we actually are from the instrumented point of view, and then I've selected a, a few highlights um, out. But please forgive me that I have a slight bias toward this system because I'm working with these systems. Okay, so this is just for, to show you what we actually, because we want to have a complete coverage of the, um, of the energy range, ranging from MEV up to PEV energies. And this is now what we say, this closing, what I've called this closing the gap to Fermi left, which is something where I showed you here with the HES system running in Namibia. They have this four 12 meter um, telescopes running now since more than 10 years. And now since shortly they have operation, brought into operation this, um, um, big telescope, this big Cherenkov telescope, which is the biggest one in the world, with 28 meter mirror diameter here. And this is now what we actually, what we're thinking about at the beginning, that we have an energy threshold of 30 GeV, and we thought that this is really, um, let's see whether it's working. And this is really, um, it was, okay, I have to say really personally, at least to me, it was a bit of a surprise that it's actually working. And this is the proof that it's working, just from the um, principle, just to see the closing the gap to Fermi. What you can see here is the phasogram of the Vila pulsar, which has a spinning period of 89 uh, milliseconds. And this is a known pulsar which was seen by, by Fermi before. And um, we actually can see here in the phase diagram, okay, this is one, two phases, so this is two times this 89 milliseconds, and you see this nice peaks here that we can see really TEV, or just, sorry, GEV emission here from this pulsar here on the ground, and there you can see here the energy distribution, which is not the flux yet. I think this is something what we have to uh, still show that we are able to do, but this is, you see this at the average energy of 40 GEV, even lower in the reconstructed energy. So this is really a source at the threshold, which which we can see even in standard observation mode. So this gives us really a calibration source, which is also the problem with these instruments. You do not have a test beam like in a particle physics detector, but you need some kind of calibration sources, which we actually have here. And so that we can really see that for these um, variable sources, for this, um, that we can even also see transients, we will see them down to thresholds of 30 GeV, which is very important for one of the main topics, what we have with the big telescope, is to see this also for GRB searches. So this is one aspect, which is just to see that this is this gap to Fermi is closed. The other thing, of course, is, is what concerns pulsar physics, and this is not only Wheeler. So the, the question is, of course, there have been more than 150 pulsars measured by Fermi, and lots of cuts off, cutoffs have been measured in the spectrum. I will show you one in a minute. minute. But the question is, of course, how this, is, how this continues, whether these are really cutoffs or whether this is continuing. And just to show you, the, since this is Wheeler, is now the second pulsar we see in the ground, on the ground. There was the Krebs pulsar um, detected before on the ground by the MAGIC telescope system. And then, then Veritas had even discovered here that the spectrum even goes up to 300 GeV, so that this is not just a cutoff, but there is a continuation here. And even meanwhile, the, the Fermi, uh, sorry, the MAGIC collaboration has even detected 
connected between these two peaks, some bridge emission here. So this turns out to be a very complicated system, and we are really not sure whether this is a general trend of these pulsars. And um, so it's very important to get more of these, and this is something we have seen here. You can see nothing yet, and we do not know whether this is continuing, but we have at least the second pulsar to see um, how this actually continues. So this is really working fine, and this is really shows how this, this field is evolving. And just to show you here, this is this, um, the overall um, spectrum from Wheeler, and this is where HES2 um, will come and see and where it will continue, where you can see there are just these upper limits from Fermi. So this is really a nice match, what we have here, and um, it, con it will continue to be, I think, a very exciting field. So, but now going up in energy, where are we now in um, above these this energies of this Drenkov system? There is the Hawk Observatory at a very high, um, at four kilometers height. You have to go as close as possible to the shower to measure really the, the particles from the shower with this um, area covered here. And this is the current status, of course, I'm not quite sure whether it's the current one, it's at least the status two weeks ago, and the completion is scheduled for um, this year. And here you can see this water tanks where you can see then here from from the pattern of an air shower here, you can distinguish whether these are photons or whether these are hadrons. And um, this is really a nice technique because, as I said, these, these detectors will run day and night. And even with just one third of the array for three months of data, the Hawk collab um, co um, collaboration has then um, seen this sky map here where you can see here, these are the regions where, where Hawk is blind. And, but you can see here also, this is the galactic plane. This is the Crab Nebula, which they will see every day. This is the standard candle in gamma ray astronomy. They will see it every day. So this is now um, becoming functional, and then we will expect really a lot of these from this instrument in the, in the coming years. So, but this is the, as just to show you that from the instrumental point of view, we have this full coverage now, and this is the reason why we, working in gamma ray astronomy, are calling this now this golden age of gamma ray astronomy. We never had this before with this, um, with this precision. Okay, but now this is where we actually are, and this is something here I show you here. This is the gamma ray sky as measured by the, by the Fermi um, satellite above, um, so at GEV energies, we can see here in galactic coordinates, this is our Milky Way, and they have identified now in their second um, catalog uh, more than 1,800 sources, where you see a few of them just by eye here, but many more, but then there's of course, the, the most of them which are really clearly identified are extragalactic, and this, but there are many galactic sources here, but they are still some confused with diffused emission. And I should say, this is the here, the diffused emission here, we are looking inside the Milky Way and we have lots of material in front of us and there's lots of interaction with cosmic rays. I think this is the most difficult task here really to find out what is really diffused emission, what are just unknown, so, um, unidentified sources, and so on and so forth, and um, I will come to this. Um, in a bit more detail um, later. So now overlaid here is now the situation which we have at TEV energies where we also, due to the fact that we are not able with this Cherenkov systems to really to measure large structures, this is something we have to learn. This is why we are really looking more for these point-like or slightly ex extended sources, but we are now at this 150 sources and we have seen that the sky is full of them. Okay, but where are we now and what concerns the scientific highlight? And it's clear from this because this is an enormous problem that we are not able to, um, or that I'm really not able here to, to cover all of this. So we made really big progress in imaging of cosmic particle accelerator um, sites. We do a lot of physics, which was pulsars and also pulsar winds, which are these relativistic environments around pulsars where you have this ultra relativistic um, particles just flowing out. There are this whole sky service. We are probing extragalactic background light there's extreme variability in active galactic nuclei, which we actually can see and which we can map, and um, being connected also to a, a worldwide alert system. And then, of course, there is just limits on dark matter. So once we have understood all this, what is this foreground, astrophysical foreground, then we can see what if there is something what we really do not understand and we put limits on them. And it's very clear that there is major contribution from all the instruments, but I cannot, of course, not cover them all. But let me now start with something which is supernova remnants, which was once one of the prime motivations to go into the step for gamma ray astronomy, is really to identify the sources of galactic cosmic rays. And I show you here just a sample of these supernova remnants where you can see, really see this, this shell structure in gamma rays, and then this is here for comparison is the one in X-rays where you can see they're really nicely matched. 
This is what we have shown here with this um, just showing that they are bright in, um, in gamma rays. It, that really that shock wave acceleration here at the, um, at the shock wave is taking place. We see them brightening here. This is just some kind of limp brightening. This is just a projection effect. What you can easily see, the, we see also gamma ray emission really from the inner parts here. So this is something we, we um, see, but the question is, of course, is this actually all what we, what we um, or search for? So can we just close this chapter? And I show you here a compilation of um, not an, an really an up-to-date one, but still, I think, fairly complete one of the supernova remnants we see in gamma rays over the Fermi and um, Trankov energy range here. And although this might look very complicated, one can really um, get a bit more aura into this by just looking how old these supernova remnants are. Because these, these accelerators which are working are not working like the LHC, which you switch on and you get the same energy all the time. They have really some time evolution. There's some history in this, in this supernova remnant. And as you can see, these young ones to middle-aged ones, then they are more effective. And then once they get old, I think they are not so effective anymore. This means that they do not reach these very high energies anymore. More. So this is the situation that we start to get really a population where we can really start the time evolution of these of these system. And there have been just last year, there have been also a big breakthrough has been achieved by just looking at these two ones which are here at the at the edge here. But um, I just want to show you this here where they actually are. This one is IC443 and the other one is W44. And there they have actually, the Fermi has, was able really to measure here the pion cutoff. So if this is, if this are photons coming from pi zero decays, we have to get an, an, a, a cutoff at low energies. And this you can see here, and this was actually also mentioned by science as one of the breakthroughs, um, science breakthroughs of last year, that we can have a clear indication of a pion cutoff, which cannot be modeled by coming from electron Bremsstrahlung processes here. So this must be really um, hadrons um, being accelerated here at these, um, uh, in these supernova remnants. So there are these two, which are really the good candidates because they are so bright and they are so it was able to really to identify this. But it's clear that the population we have is by far incomplete and we do not know whether they really reach up to this PEV energies in this, in this supernova remnants um, as we um, expect it. And so there's really lots of work ahead, uh, work ahead of us. And I wanted just to show you um, two examples of the supernova remnants which um, we find by, by looking into our data. And this are what I call extreme supernova remnant. This is, first of all, this one is actually the one where you can see here, this is the spectrum from this supernova remnant compared to one which is as um one of, um, of our um, brightest supernova remnants, but given the fact that this one is more or less a factor of five or six or seven further away than the source I show here, this is much more luminous, and this is actually currently the most luminous galactic TV source which we have discovered. And there is this one here, this supernova remnant, which is actually, you can see here, this is where, where we are, and these are the, the known TEV sources, and there you can see that we have a clear selection bias, but we are just going through the whole, um, through the whole Milky Way and um, see many more of these, so there's lots of things are going on here. But let me now just continue to another type of source which turns out to be very interesting for us, which is the galactic center. And this is here an access map measured by Hess and where you can see the galactic center source. And there's another here um, composite supernova remnant here, but there's lots of diffused emission around. And we spend really quite some time, and this is the problem we have, to disentangle sources from diffused components around. And this actually, we managed that we since here, this is the overall spectrum, and the red line here with the cutoff is the central source we have here, and the diffused um, the diffuse emission which we see here around this center has no indication of a cutoff yet and this means that there's the central source here is accelerating protons so up to energies of more than 500 TeV and I should say that we really do not sure what this central source here actually is. So this is one point and this is now, this is just above, sorry I should, I should have mentioned this, this is the, um, the access map which we have above um, 200, 200 GeV, and if we now look at with this HES2, with this, um, with this larger telescope, we can actually produce already a, a sky map here at, at more than 100 GeV, and we see the source, um, at the center source, but we have really the background around here needs to be studied in more detail before we really can say actually what is going on here, what concerns diffused emission, but we see also extended emission already around here. 
But of course, this brings me now to one of these other topics what we can really, where we can contribute to, um, with gamma ray astronomy, which is dark matter search with, um, with um, gamma rays. So this is just a prediction of the gamma rays um, to, to be seen by Fermi Lat. And there basically it's shown just, I just show you a compilation here of what the search strategies are. There's, first of all, of course, we, speak, we have this much um, uh, dark matter is expected in our galactic center that we can look for diffused emission, but I will not comment on that. But there, of course, there are much clearer signals of this uh, if you find spectral signatures or if we look at individual sources, like for example, dwarf galaxies, where we do not expect gamma ray um, emission if we see something, and then it has already been mentioned before, there is the plus or minus spectrum. Let me briefly mention this, what concerns the line emission seen by with Fermi. They have published now a very detailed analysis of their full sky and they see no line emission. They have a most significant fit. It's something with a local significance of 3.3 .3 sigma at 130 GeV, but the overall global significance is 1.5 sigma. They have during this study this, the systematics in very much detail about this line um, here and they find the much better understanding and they see a similar feature in the Earth limb data. So this is a, something which is, seems not to be coming from, um, from dark matter, but there's still some un, not well understood systematic effects in here in the detector, but there may be quite, really quite some um, progress. What concerns dwarf galaxies is there have been all the, the, the ground beds, also Fermi has, has published very um, good limits, but I just want to show you that there's still this lot of potential in this ground based instrument. This is the current um, limits which are set by, by Veritas, and this are the, the model calculation where they expect, okay, this is some orders of magnitudes away, but if you look, this is within the next five years, they will reach it, and then there is something, there is already some initiatives ongoing to combine data of the different um, Cherenkov systems here to really to get even uh, much better limits here. Okay, but now let me come to something which we have just um, discussed before and where we can also contribute, and I think we have to contribute, this is the, what I mentioned with this, to understand the foreground better. Here, what you can sh uh, show here is a publication from this author where the data points, is actually this is here the electron spectrum, which is the positron spectrum. Here you can see the combined spectrum and here you can see the positron fraction. And the model curves, which you can see here, is just a model based on some astrophysical known sources. So this is an overall contribution at lower energies from electrons from all over the place. But then at higher energies, due to the, to the um, low um, uh, distance an electron at high energy travels, because the major energy loss, which is synchrotron radiation scales with E um, squared, is that they have, they have just must come from very nearby sources. And this is something what they have just put in, such some assumption on supernova remnant pulsar wind nebulas around us, and what you can see that they can nicely model all the data which has been published um, so far. But of course, one should mention that this is something here, there are lots of model assumptions in, because we do not know what the local, local sources here really are contributing. And I'd like to show you this here in this overview. This is our Milky Way. This is where we are. And there you can see that this is, and, and if you look at this very high energy electrons here in the um, GV or above range, I think they are just coming here from close by region. They cannot travel through the whole galaxy. So any assumption which we make on that there's some homogeneous contribution is wrong. And um, just to um, sketch this in a bit more detail here in something which is around this 500 parsecs or 1,000 or kiloparsecs around, this is where we have um, see our sun, and this in red are supernova remnants, and this in gray, this are pulsars here. And this is now where we can actually contribute here with this instrument, and this is something which I call the astrophysical foreground, which are this pulsar wind nebula. We have this large extended gamma ray emission from these, um, from these objects, and that we actually started now to do some population studies to better understand, for example, what is the pulsar wind extension at the function of the age, and so that this is something that we can learn more about these um, local sources, because the problem we have that the local sources are so much extended that we have really problems in identifying them. So, but this is just an ongoing study, which I think is, is absolutely necessary to understand whether there is something in the positron spectrum which we do not expect. 
So this brings me to my conclusion. I think this is gamma ray experiments today offer a unique view to our high energy universe in this very large energy range and they deliver unprecedented data and they result in, I think this is goes to this community, in an increased understanding of the astrophysical foreground where I think the astrophysical foreground on its own is very interesting. But and this is makes clear that this we have to, to have to cover the whole energy range. I hope this is something that Fermi will operate already for, for the next years and then of course in the the Trankov system, and this is then my last slide with some advertisement. I think we have to build the Trankov telescope array. We will build it, and this is a huge improvement in all aspects of performance. We will have a an, an, an proposal-driven observatory, and this is okay as a 27 nation, a 200 million euro project, and um, I think this will become, and I think this is necessary, and I hope I got you at least an idea why this is necessary. Thank you very much. So we are unfortunately running a little bit late leading into the uh, coffee break. If you have really urgent question, you must ask. Otherwise, we'll go into a coffee break. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's thanks to all the speakers in this session.